Now we move to the scientific part of the meeting. The first speaker is Professor Mike Robb from the chemistry department at Imperial College in London, who will tell us about uh, use, using Gaussians for quantum dynamics. In the pocket. Almost the only way to follow the last two speakers would be to sing Bon Compliane a Te. Uh, but first of all, I can't sing. Uh, and secondly, I, you know, I, just, I just can't pull that off. But best wishes for your 60th. And thank you very much for inviting me here. It's always a pleasure to come to Pisa uh, and to lecture in this, in, this, in this fantastic room. I think the first time I gave a lecture in here was about 20 years ago. And I did try and give the introduction to my talk in, in Italian. But unfortunately, I had to memorize it, uh, and, and so it just doesn't work. So I'm going to give a rather general talk today on some work that we've been doing uh, in quantum dynamics. I think we're a rather broad spectrum of people, so I'm going to give it at a fairly low, sort of chatty level. Um, probably I'll lose half my audience for each equation that's in there, so I don't think there are any, 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 any equations. Uh, so hopefully it's, it's uh, a fairly general approach. The picture you see there uh, is where I come from uh, in London. Imperial College is just on the other side of, of Hyde Park. Uh, and I'm going to talk, ah, oh, this is this modern pointer you were talking about. Uh, and, and I'm going to talk mainly about applications to, to, pho to photochemistry. So in the same way that journals put a graphical table of contents, maybe that's, maybe that's where I should start. So. Uh, my applications are going to be to photochemistry, so I've got five minutes to tell you everything you ever needed to know about, about photochemistry. Uh, and then I want to talk about the theory of the type of wave functions that we're going to use to describe nu nuclear motion. Uh, and this equation fits almost anywhere in, in theoretical chemistry. Uh, it's a linear combination of something. Uh, and in this case, I'm going to talk about linear combinations of Gaussians. And these Gaussians are going to be centered on, on trajectories. So they're going to be like classical dy dy dynamics. But instead of being driven by the Newtonian equations of motion, they'll be driven by the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. And then I want to try and convince you that it works. Um, so I'm going to give you a benchmark example uh, where one looks, as we should with any new technique, about the sort of the numbers of basis functions you need to describe the problem uh, and whether you can explore the whole space. Uh, and then I've got some applications, uh, which I'll talk about fairly superficially, I, I think. Uh, I always forget, forget my collaborators. Uh, and they're the most important people. Uh, and I haven't run any of these calculations myself. Um, the most important person is probably Graham Wirth, where, where it all started about eight years or so ago. He now has a permanent post uh, at the University of Birmingham. And uh, he has been associated with the development of the multi-configuration multi time-dependent Hartree-Fock uh, vibrational code. Uh, and that's what these calculations are, are built on. These are the people who worked with me at Imperial College on the, on the problem, in particular Charlotte Allen uh, and David Mondiv Tapia. I'm going to talk a little bit about the work of Arthur Ismailov, who came uh, about two years ago now to my group in, in London and now has a post in Toronto. But the person who did all the hard work in coding uh, and really turned the, the method into a, a workable approach uh, was Benjamin Sorn from the University of Montpellier. Uh, he did two postdocs with me and then went, went, he now has a full-time post uh, in Montpellier. Can you hear me over that? Yeah, it's just me that can't hear. OK, so now a quick lesson in photochemistry. So this is everything you need to know about photochemistry in one slide, I think. Um, you imagine uh, you're on the ground state, and you absorb light. And when you absorb light, uh, you go to a different potential surface. So you go from the, the orange surface to, to the blue surface. Then when you get on the excited state, uh, because you're in a different electronic state, the electron cement is in a different place. The gradients are no, are no longer zero. And now the, so the system begins to evolve on the excited state and has to undergo a radiationless transition to the, to the ground state. 
And it's now more or less accepted that this radiationless transition occurs through a, a surface crossing, which is known as a conical intersection. Uh, and in the way I've drawn it, uh, I've tried to take this pair of potential surfaces and use three distinguished coordinates. I do this only to draw a cartoon. Uh, we do all of our calculations in all the degrees of freedom, but I have to illustrate the results in some way, so I'll do it with cartoons like, the, like this. And the first coordinate that's of interest is this radiationless decay coordinate, which I've called x12. And then there's a double cone centered on it, just to indicate that as I move along this coordinate, it's some vector in this space of x1 and x2, which is the coordinate of a, of a, of a double cone, hence the name conical intersection. And this is a seam that joins these two surfaces. So if I move along a direction contained in this plane, then I encounter this surface crossing. And the other coordinate is some coordinate that is orthogonal to that space, and I'm just calling it the adiabatic path coordinate. So when you photo excite, the system will evolve on this surface, and of course what controls what, what might happen in a photochemical reaction is whether it decays there or whether it decays there. This, this would just be a photophysical process, and this would be a photochemical process, a new, a, new, a new chemical species. So that's almost all you need to know to understand this talk. But just let me elaborate on uh, what the potential surface looks like in the space of the, of the conical intersection itself. This is uh, the branching plane of the conical inter intersection. And because it's two-dimensional, then unlike a, a thermal reaction, when you decay in this space, uh, then your reaction paths on, on the ground state uh, are spread in that space, x1 and x2. So just look at that same picture again. It should be pretty obvious then if I'm talking about decay through one of these surface crossings or conical intersections uh, that uh, dynamics has got to be involved in controlling the outcome of such, of such a process. The simplest form of dynamics is one that doesn't have any uh, acceleration, which would be a minimum energy pathway on the, on, the, on the potential surface passing through the double cone. Uh, one can compute classical trajectories. And what I want to talk about today is just taking the next step, which is floating Gaussian wave functions or Gaussian wave packets on those classical trajectories and using the time-dependent Schrodinger equation to discuss the evolution of the nuclear uh, masses rather than the, no, the no, no, Newtonian equations uh, using just the gradients. So I didn't invent this field. There are a lot of, lot of people involved in doing quantum dynamics over the, over the years. And these are the types of methods that, um, that have been used. Um, some of them involve fitting a potential surface point by point, and they are by far the most accurate uh, but obviously you have to make a choice about the particular internal variables that you're going to use for doing, for doing quantum dynamics. So the other possibility is the one that interests me most, uh, which is where you have a, a basis set that rather, being, rather than being fixed on this grid actually moves um, in time. And there are a whole host of these. And this is the technique that we've been exploiting um, together with my, with my colleagues, the direct dynamics variational multi-configuration goes in uh, method, DDVMCG, but all you really have to do is try and remember that these are Gaussians floating on trajectories, but the motion of those Gaussians and the position of those trajectories is determined from the time-dependent Schrodinger equation rather than Newton's equations of motion. And of course, there are a variety of semi-classical methods uh, involving surface, surface hopping as well. Uh, so here are my couple of equations. I apologize, but I think they're very simple, and I'll try and explain them with, with pictures if I can. So uh, I'm interested in photochemistry, so I'm looking at nuclear dynamics uh, with nuclear wave functions, solving the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. I must have a representation of the ground state and the excited state. So this is the equation that governs the motion uh, on the both ground and the, and the excited state. We're using nuclear wave packets, and these are linear combinations of Gaussians with a weight, and the weight is determined from the evolution of the, of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. These are the Gaussians. They are functions of both the position 
uh, and the momentum, and the positions of these Gaussians are determined variationally from the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. That's about all you really need to know. Uh, this is sort of picture you need to keep in the back of your mind that I photolyze on the excited state, so this particular wave function gets occupation and it evolves in time. So what comes out of the method is where do the trajectories go on the surface and then what is the weight of each one of the Gaussians that's centered on those, on those trajectories. And we use Mulliken population analysis and things like that, all the techniques that you'd use. Um, and there's only one technical point that might be of interest to, to, to a couple of people in the audience, and that's this subscript here that occurs on the A. It's a question of whether I allow a Gaussian on the excited state and one on the ground state to go wandering off, off at will, and that's one approach. Or I can have one Gaussian that follows one trajectory and it has a Gaussian on the upper surface and a Gaussian on the, on the lower surface, and I don't let those two flow independently. So it's sort of a type of contracted Gaussian, if you, if you like. And that proves to be, that second idea proves to be more efficient. You may need more Gaussian basis functions, but one of the technical difficulties with this method is if you have a Gaussian wave function that doesn't have any weight, then it goes wandering off into the boondocks and you end up with uh, also all sorts of technical difficulties. Of course, what lies behind all of this is a quantum chemistry cal calculation because the potential surface has to come from somewhere and it's computed on the fly and we use CASA-CF for, 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 for doing that. So this is the picture that I'd like you to take away with you, uh, that I have these Gaussians involving in time uh, and the parameters that I, I'm looking at are the position and the momenta associated with those Gaussians and the weight. Uh, in the linear combination of Gaussian's approach. And these things are following trajectories, but again, the, the evolution of those trajectories is controlled by quantum mechanics. And then, as I mentioned, one can do a population analysis, all the sorts of population analysis that you do in wave functions to interpret the results. So just a couple of brief technical de 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 details. Each one of the Gaussians is associated with a local harmonic approximation of the potential surface. That means we're doing a quantum chemistry calculation, CASA CF calculation behind each Gaussian, and that's occurring all the time in space. Um, so if I have 24 Gaussians, I need 24 processes, and each one of those calculations is running in independently. And then they talk to each other via, via the solution to the uh, Schrodinger equation, so they evolve in time according to, to, to quantum dynamics. And the, the Gaussians themselves change their position, and there are the, there's the weight of each Gaussian that comes out of the calculation. Since the most expensive part of the calculation is actually the quantum chemistry calculation, um, we try and build up a database as we're, as we're doing these, these computations of the quantum chemistry result. So, in order to propagate these wave functions, we need to do a quantum chemistry calculation as both first and second derivatives, and that swamps everything. So if we're doing a surface, we build up a database, and if we find ourselves in some place on the surface, the first thing we do is say, have I, have I done this calculation before somewhere within that quadratic approximation? And if so, we, we, we pick it up from the, uh, from, from the, on the database. The, the end product is also that we end up with quite an interesting rep representation of the, of the potential surface in that database as well, but we've not explored that. So to try and summarize the theoretical part, um, we have a multidimensional Gaussian basis. Each basis function is a Hartree product of those, of, those, of those Gaussians. The one particle Gaussian functions are like your molecular orbitals, but they're describing uh, nuclear motion. The time-dependent basis functions go where they're needed most. They're optimized uh, from, from, from one step to, to the other. And we select the number of, we, we, we don't predispose the analog of the orbital exponents uh, and so on. Uh, it's only the number of basis functions that we, that we choose. So this is a list of the, the types of, of, of systems that we've studied with this technique. And I'm just going to pick up a couple of the, of, the more, of the more recent ones. So what I want to talk about first then is a benchmark type computation. For some reason, Fulvine has become a benchmark in the field of, 
of, of trying to do this type of, of, comp of computation. Um, and it's been treated in a variety of ways with, with quantum dynamics and with trajectories. and has most of the features of your ideal photochemical system, but as far as I know, you can't come anywhere near it experimentally, which also has its advantages. So we only have to worry about other, 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 other theoreticians. So this is this picture, like the one that I showed you earlier. And what are the two? What are the coordinates that are that are, are, are of interest? And I emphasize again, this is just for discussion. We use all the geometrical variables in the problem. The photochemical decay involves a skeletal deformation of the full vein. You essentially, go from a situation where I've got localized double bonds to one that's to one that's delocalized. That's this coordinate. That's the radiation, the decay coordinate that takes you to to the seam. Then the seam is described by the torsion about this double bond. And what's of interest is that uh, I have a, a conical intersection seam at the symmetric geometry, which is sloped and looks like this. But by the time I get to a twisted geometry over here, it's peaked. So you can almost guess what's going to happen in the dynamics. Uh, if I end up on this coordinate, I will just cross back and forth between the ground state and the, and the, and the excited state. Uh, but as I, as I begin to, as the wave packet spreads into torsional motion, um, then I, I can go through the, through the surface crossing uh, and end up on the, on the ground space. So, if, so that if I, mod, if I monitor the population on the excited state, what would I expect to see? Well, I'll see it going down because some of the population will leak over, over here. But then I should see it coming back because it can cross and come back up. So I, I should see recurrences. So these are all things that are quite difficult to describe with, with trajectories that are ideal for the world of quantum dynamics. All right. So these are the results of the benchmark. You can't see this picture. But there are, there are two aspects of the problem that one ought to be able to reproduce. Right? One of them is I ought to be able to see the population decaying in a stepwise fashion with recurrences. So that's the, that's the essential result from the, from, from the quantum dynamics. And then I ought to be able to demonstrate that my wave function spans the relevant part of the, of the, of the space, since I've actually not put that in the polymer. And this has, this has 24 basis functions. And really, this is the population decay from the excited state. You can see that the population decays and then, and then, re, then recurs. That means it's quite close to the central part of the, of the, of the potential surface, where it just goes to the ground state and comes back up. And then you can see that that recurrence uh, tails away as the molecule, as the wave packet spreads and begins to twist. And that population goes away from the place that it's sloped and can't come back up to the excited state. Um, so this is, these are the torsional geometries that get explored. And this table, which you can't see, unfortunately, uh, is just giving you the, just convincing you that you do explore the range of both torsional geometries uh, and the range of, of skeletal, de skeletal deform deformations. So these results, these types of computations have been done using grid methods. They've been done using trajectories. And all of the results are in more or less general uh, agreement. In some ways, the quantum dynamics calculations with only 24 basis functions are the most efficient in human terms uh, because, as I said, the only thing you decide on is the number of basis functions that you're going, that you're going to use. Um, and so that's the last point, really, that I, that I want to make. Um, I need to check and demonstrate that I'm getting some sort of convergence um, by looking at uh, the population decay, whether I use 2, 4, 6, 24 basis functions. And as you can see from this plot, uh, looking at the magnitude of the, of the recurrences that occur, uh, that I'm beginning to get convergence at 16 to 24 basis functions. And I get the same, I get more or less the same thing in terms of the spread of the, of the population. Well, associated with this benchmark, uh, I wanted to just ben mention some other results briefly that were carried out by author Ismailov when he visited me last year. Uh, and that is to, was to try and come back and use the sort of analog of Marcus type, type theory uh, for excited state, which is known as the Fermi Golden Rule method. 
uh, and to see if we can take the parameters that we get out of uh, a static cal calculation and treat the method and compare that with the, with the quantum dynamics results. And I just want to show you that there's obviously sc some, some scope here. These are the results from the quantum dynamics and these are the ones that have come from um, running a simulation with the type of potential surface that lies behind the, um, the non-equilibrium Fermi-Golden rule approach. And so you can see with a parameterized surface with just a, a few variables, this linear of ironic coupling, you, you can reproduce the essential features of the quantum dynamics. And uh, this is the results of the population dynamics um, with the Gaussian wave functions and this Fermi Golden Rule approach. Again, trying to show you the behavior of the, of the recurrences. So I think one is beginning to approach the possibility where using simplified methods for doing the, the, dy the dynamics uh, based on a Fermi Golden Rule type, type approach is beginning to look promising. Uh, so just, just one other example of that Fermi Golden Rule approach. Uh, intermolecular electron transfer in the adamantyl in a bismethylene radical cation. Um, I need to explain the, the chemistry here rather well, carefully. I have an adamantane cage and an ethylene at this end and an ethylene at this end that are at exactly 90 degrees to each other held there with the, with the adamantane cage. And this is another theoretical example that's again used for, for, for benchmarks of, the, of this sort. I can have the charge localized at one end or charge localized at the other end. I can have them partially twisted and there may, and there may, and there may be a, a transition state. So this, is a, this can be a non-adiabatic process and we treat it with two potential surfaces. One potential surface, let's say one, one diabatic surface corresponds to say this structure that would correspond to this slice. The other potential surface corresponds to this slice which would have the charge at the, at, at the other end. In this space there's a conical intersection in the middle and a very small region where there's a, where there's a transition state here. So the objective was to do the dynamics on this system And this is the type of geometry change uh, that, that, that one sees in doing, in doing the calculations. One can have a, an, an unreactive trajectory or, or un, unreactive system where the Gaussian does not cross the, the, the surface crossing. Uh, one can have a situation where the Gaussian migrates from one side of the surface to, to, to the other through something that's like a transition stage or one can have a completely non-adiabatic process uh, that involves an excursion on the excited state and decay to the, to, to, to the ground state. And so I just want to show you that um, one can get reasonable convergence with the numbers of basis functions for that, for, that, for that lifetime. And as you can see, there's a population that decays uh, relatively quickly and tails off in time. And you're beginning to get that population uh, remaining quite, quite stable, even with a relatively small number of Gaussian basis functions. And these are things that look like trajectories, but the sole purpose is to demonstrate that they explore the range of possibilities that I showed you a moment ago. And you can see that I have trajectories uh, where, where I don't go through a surface crossing, uh, ones that I do, ones where I take an excursion on the excited state uh, and come back. And I guess that's the key thing with the quantum dynamics. You need to have enough basis functions so that they explore the part, all the parts of the potential surface uh, without you putting any bias in. And of course, we, we, having, run, having done all of those cal calculations again, we went back and went to look uh, again at the results of a non-Fermi Golden Rule uh, approach. And as you can see again, the results look, look reasonably Look, look reasonably good. So these quantum dynamic studies, which are quite extensive, can be used to test and calibrate other methods as, as well. What time am I supposed to finish? 
It says 10.15 on the program, but I started 10, min 10 minutes early, so. Hmm? 15 minutes, okay. Uh, so, now, so now I want to come to a real live example. Uh, and what I, what I really want to talk about is what you see as an end user in doing these, in doing these quantum dynamics cal cal calculations. And this is the cis-trans isomerization, isomerization of a cyanine dye. So the reaction coordinate is this trans to cis isomerization. There are two potential surfaces. And so this is this X3 coordinate that I talked about. This coordinate going back into the paper is in fact a, a skeletal deformation of the, of the cyanine dye. The, the system has been studied exper experimentally and that there are big bulky groups on both ends so that it can be done in, in solution. Um, so the objective is, is to see if, it, this is the if this is the type of problem that might be amenable to looking at whether or not one can control uh, reactivity via a laser. And the idea in this case was to see if one could turn off uh, the cis-trans isom isomerization. So this is the, the type of potential surface that we determined about six years ago using quantum trajectories, using classical trajectories. And we've come back now to look at them uh, with quantum trajectories. And I can explain most of the ideas with this cartoon. So the reaction coordinate is the trans to cis isomerization. The radiation, this decay coordinate is the asymmetric stretch of this species. And then what, what one sees on the potential surface is a seam of intersection uh, as I move along this uh, anti-symmetric stretch coordinate. The ground state potential surface, because it has a torsion, has a minimum and a minimum with a barrier inside. So if you looked at that potential surface and you said, how can I turn off the cis-trans isomerization and make it not happen, then it's clear it suggests that I should excite this skeletal deformation so that when it arrives on the excited state, the system will cross the seam of intersection here and decay to the products. Uh, if I wanted to make sure that the, that the isomerization occurred, then I'd want to do almost the reverse, take energy out of those skeletal de deformation coordinates so that it moved down the slow coordinate and decayed near the maximum on the ground state potential surface and went on, on to product. So the question is, can I, can I at least carry out that experiment the theoretically uh, and experimentally and turn off the cis-trans isomerization? Um, so this summarizes the sort of interplay between theory and experiment. It's quite hard to read from the side. Hopefully, you, you, you can see it from, uh, from, from on the front. This is the paper we published in 2005. They did, did the classical trajectories. Then the group in Lunt uh, did an optimal control experiment uh, that had the high frequency modes uh, in the excitation pulse uh, and demonstrated that they could reduce the quantum yield for the isom isomerization. It's about a year or so ago now that we finished the results of the uh, quantum dynamics cal calculations. And um, people have come back again and done the experiments a year, a year again later and essentially show that the key to controlling the reactivity uh, with a laser uh, is to control the population of the skeletal de de deformation modes. So th this is what you actually see when you do a calculation. And again, the details aren't very important in all of this, but this is what you get out of a quantum dynamics cal calculation. So with, with only four basis functions, I can explain the main ideas. One's done the calculation with a, with a, lot, with a lot more. So let's suppose I'm at the Frank Condon point, uh, and I'm just going to, well, classically, I would just simply let a ball, ball start, to start to roll at the, Frank, at the Frank Condon region. But in fact, I have these four trajectories each with a Gaussian basis function on them. And the first thing they do is they encounter uh, the conical inter inter intersection, and they don't encounter it at the same time. There's a spread in time at which they reach the in in intersection, and a spread in geometries, and they go on to evolve on the, gr on the ground state. And the wave function, each one of these trajectories with a basis function on it, has a different weight. 
and so the probability you get in the same way by looking at the total wave function. So this, if you like, is the evolution of the basis functions, and then the wave function, the quantum mechanics, tells you the weight of each one of the weight of each one of those. And of course, they are exploring the geometries. The, there are three of, three of those four basis functions that go on towards the product, and one goes back towards the, the reactants. So you've got a wave function describing this process, which is a combination of three trajectories going forward to the product and one going back. But of course, one uses a lot more. The, the basis functions cross the conical intersection seam at different geometries and at different times. And so this is the result you get out to try and think about these things. These are the populations of each one of those Gaussians, and you can say that you can see that they change in time. These are the populations on the excited state, and those are the populations on the on the ground state. And if one if one wants to demonstrate that one can cross without twisting, uh, then you can change the conditions in your initial wave packet and to try and simulate the exper experiment. Uh, in fact, we've done this in a relatively crude way just by putting in a momentum displacement uh, on the vector. And the, and the displacement that we've put in is one that displaces the system towards, uh, if you like, it, it puts energy in those anti-symmetric uh, stretch modes. You can see then that as the system, as those four basis functions evolve, you can see that the basis functions cross the scene at different points in time and at, and, at, and, and, and at different geometries. But what distinguishes them is that there is mainly the planar crossing geometries that, that cross. So I think uh, perhaps that's a good place to stop. I've got a couple more examples that maybe I should leave some, some, some time for questions. The sort of takeaway message is that from a practical point of view, doing these computations is very much like running classical trajectories. If you can run classical trajectories, then you can do these types of computations. You have to worry about how many basis functions you need to use, and that means that you have to have enough basis functions in your calculation so that they explore all of the potential surface uh, that you need. But unlike classical trajectories, you, you don't have to choose the real details of the individual basis functions, those are being, those are being optimized. The, the classical trajectories are being governed by the quantum mechanics and steered by the quantum mechanics. And even in this example where you can see that where the decay to the ground state surface is not localized in time, of course the, the total wave function you will compute and analyze and you will end up with a discussion of the probability or the, the time when the maximum probability of decay will, 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 will occur. So I'm quite optimistic about, about this method. Um, if I had a bit, bit more time, there's one other example I could have showed you on formaldehyde where the calculations were done by somebody without any formal training in, in, quant, in quant, quantum dynamics at all. And the results are more or less as easy to interpret as STO3G calculations on electrons. You're just looking at the out of the calculations of the, of the nuclei. So thank you very much for your attention, and bon compliant. Thank you, Professor Rob, for this very nice lecture. And now this lecture is open for comments and questions. So thank you very much. It's very inspiring. Um, I was thinking you, that you were mentioning that you need enough uh, basis function to explore the whole uh, surface. Uh, but another parameter probably is not to have artificial holes in your uh, way packet. I mean, if you explore, but you leave. Uh, uh, sure, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So also, this can be a technical yeah, you, problem. Yes, you must. It's, it's, it's the same problem as doing calculations for elect electronic structure. Right? You, need the, you need the flexibility in your basis, and uh, we, all, we all know that if you're going to do an STO3G calculation on something with heteroatoms in it and so on, you need to allow those basis functions to be polarized so that you'll fill the space. And the, the problems are exactly the same. The, the, difficulty, 
The real practical difficulty that we have here is almost the reverse one. If I put in too many basis functions, well, I over -complete you're over and I, it's not that I get singularities, but I end up with basis functions without any weight in them, which cause yeah. me horrendous technical problems because all of each one of these basis functions has a quantum chemistry calculation going on for each clock tick. And so if one of them goes wandering off into the boondocks, then the active space for the castle CF becomes rubbish way over there and the calculation crashes and then you've lost everything. <laughs> And if possible, another. Um, and I, I was, since of course any expectation value actually is coming not only from the diagonal part, yes. I mean, but also from yes, the yes, diagonal yes. part. So, how <coughs> robust is the interpretation, even if I understand this qualitative interpretation, in terms of the single, let's say, trajectories? Uh, I mean, single Gaussians, yeah. Since uh, the, the true. Uh, uh, properties coming are coming from also. Yes, you're, you're saying you're you're saying I really shouldn't be looking at what's happening to the basis functions, I, and, and in a sense, I'm. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying. I, the only reason I'm showing you the basis, I'm I'm trying to show you the basis functions because they, they're easy to interpret. I mean, when we first started doing these things, we got an answer at the end, and I thought, you know, this is boring. I don't I don't understand what's going on. So in the same way. We would look at the MOs in electronic structure computation and look at their weights. Uh, maybe look at how if we, maybe we might optimize the exponents or something. And look at look at how those behave. I agree with you. In the end, you've got a wave function. At the end, you want to compute proper expectation values, and those are quite straightforward things to do. Other? Yes, I, I have a small curiosity actually. Since I, I work in the field of solvation effects, I was wondering of the possibility of extending to solvation. So, I, nobody has really done quantum di hybrid quantum dynamics calculations yet. Um, we have attempted actually to do some calculations with willonium. Um, but there are, there are some real ambiguities that don't occur in classical, in classical dynamics um, that, that we haven't quite worked out yet. It's not, it's not completely obvious how to do it. Um, because it's not, it's not obvious how to, combining classical with classical, or if you've just got a potential surface and you're computing a potential surface in a hybrid way, that's one thing. Uh, but when you put quantum dynamics on top of it, uh, and you're trying to combine that with a force field method or, or, or a field that's not, not so obvious how to do it. So I don't, I don't know the answer to your question. Perhaps implicit methods can be a way by yes. solving coordinates, something like that. Yeah. Thank you very much for the very nice uh, lecture. Uh, just a curiosity, probably you mentioned, I missed it. Uh, there are important qualitative differences between uh, the semi-classical uh, results from Sanan, for example, and the quantum one. Uh, in other words, you'd like to give you an example where the classical gets it completely wrong. Yeah. Um, so I can't do that yet. Um, I, I, I hope I will. I will be able to get it to you in the in the future. Um, the trouble is that if you take, if you run classical trajectories and you've got to do a surface hop of some, of some sort, the huge variety of methods of doing that, and they all appear to give answers that are quite different. Uh, and if you use something like Tully's view as switches, then it's, it's sort of convincing, except that to me you get uh, transitions when you're nowhere near a surface crossing and so on with that, with, with that method. So, I hope that this takes the ad hoc nature of the radiationless decay process out of the out of the loop, and that it, it also eliminates some of the some of the decisions you would other have to otherwise have to make in terms of choosing your your initial conditions or or trajectories, and it's also cheaper. Okay. Any other? If not, let's thank, thank Professor Rob again and move on to the next speaker.